Played my first game at six years old and had the vision of playing first grade from that age, really. Played all the way through to school and then, yeah, debuted professionally at the age of 19. My first three years, basically injury free. And then, yeah, unfortunately, a few injuries come and I ended up having about nine surgeries all back to back over a short period of time. So that period of my career was really hard emotionally because obviously I wanted to get back on the field full time. Do you feel that achieving your dream, which was your lifelong dream, gave you the self-belief that, hey, if I did that, I can go and be successful? success on this, I can do anything? Pretty much, yeah. Growing up at age 15, 16, they say tell it to you straight. Probably only one or two of you out of the thousand here will actually play professional sport. So to actually make it, you're in a very small minuscule scent to play professionally. So in sport, I had to do things that 99% of people weren't doing. You need to be able to know how to make money. At the end of the day, if you've got no money, you can't invest. End of story. Step one is how's your habits? How's your discipline? How's your spending habits? Are you spending all your things on Uber Eats and gambling and those sorts of things? At the end of the day, you don't have the characteristics to make an investor. So stop dreaming about being an investor. I'm Matt Srama and this is Life, Money and Love. Just quickly before we get started, guys, if you've been enjoying the podcast, can I please ask that you consider leaving a five-star review and subscribing on whatever platform you've been listening. It really helps the podcast grow. All right, we're back again. For anyone watching on YouTube, we're back in the Happy Skin Co. office. We've been bouncing around a little bit. Um, but Matty Sharma, thanks for coming in. Um, for anyone who doesn't know Matt, really cool story. Um, I want to do what we usually do. Of course, we'll touch a little bit on your journey and, and how you got to where you are today. But I really want to pick your brain on everything, property and how people can can leverage um, their whatever their financial needs are to create financial f- freedom through property. Now, Matt, you were, you were a pretty successful footballer, played 65 games for the Gold Coast Titans. Um, had to retire early um, through a, through an injury. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. But since then, what you've done, you've gone on to build a quite a, a substantial property portfolio of your own, top 1% property investors in Australia, and build it obviously a seven-figure business uh, off the back of that using your skills and your experience buying property and one of the premier buyers agents uh, in the country, absolutely killing it up on the Gold Coast to see everything you're doing, man. I wish I was up on the Gold Coast so I could explore yeah. some of those <laughs> awesome properties with you guys. And the prices compared to Sydney, man, what you'll get on the Gold Coast, Post for one, two mil versus Sydney, far out. It yeah. makes me jealous. <laughs> and, um, but dude, thanks for coming in. I know you've got a, a stack day. You're only down for a day, so appreciate your time. Um, but thanks for coming. Nah, man. Thanks for having me. I, I love what you're doing with the potty. I've been a listener for a while, so it's sick we got to connect whilst in uh, – Whilst in gloomy Sydney, I hopped, <laughs> off, I hopped off the plane, bro, and I didn't even – I was going to wear a polo shirt because yeah. it was that hot back home and then far out. I'm like <laughs> saying to the crew here, I was like, far, I wish I'd bring my suit jacket. It's freezing. <laughs> we repped Sydney in the worst possible way, oh, I'm telling man. you, man. It was so hot yesterday. Oh, it was, was mid-30s it? to late 30s. Yeah. <laughs> was, I, was at, I, was at the, um, I was at the footy. I was at Belmore for Bulldogs oh, and Tigers. Go, yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck, it was hot, man. Yeah. I would have hated to be sitting in the hill. Yeah. But literally, as, as soon as anyone comes from Queensland – Mid-20s, cloudy, dark, yeah. rainy around. It's yeah. just classic Sydney. Yeah, okay, um, but, dude, let's start. Let's start. Obviously, we've got to start with the footy just to, to, to get some context around yeah, where man. you are. But I just want to say, as, as a young boy growing up in, in, in Western Sydney, rugby league was, was a big thing for, for kids my age. But I just want to get into, like, your headspace growing up. Was, was footy always the dream for you? Yeah, growing up, footy was. Like, my, my dad played it. My uh, older brother played it. Uh, it was just such a... It was in the family and being Queensland born and bred, you know, it's a, it's a common thing even at school and whatnot. So probably from about, I played my first game at six years old and I sort of had the vision of playing first grade from that age really. You know, I used to dream of like running out in the backyard of pretend it was a stadium and that and get ready in my bedroom <laughs> like I was warming up. So yeah, it was one of those things, it sounds cliche, but kind of like a manifested and just dreamt it from a young age and there was no really plan B, which, um, yeah, I was just super hungry from it from a young age. So I played all the way through to school and then, yeah, debuted professionally at the age of 19, which is, um, yeah, got to live out my dream. Mm. So interesting what you were just talking about. Like even as a kid going through that mental preparation, the visualisation, visualising yourself running out, doing your warm-ups before game, is that something like this is jumping ahead a little bit to more how you think mm. today, but is visualization a part of your process? And did you realize what you're doing at such a young age? Right. It, I was just going to touch on that. It's funny now where I am now, like I consider myself quite holistic and I love meditation and visualization. Had no idea about it back in the day or even when I was playing as an athlete. So when I look at it, like when I was a kid, it was, it was kind of like, yeah, I, I had the mindset of that's what I'm going to do. And when we're children, I guess the thing that 
sways our past as we get into our teens is maybe someone's opinion of you or you know you might have done something a certain way and someone said something to you and it made you you know your belief change and I think I don't know you look back when you're a kid man you you can dream whatever you want and then the dreams get kind of knocked out of you as you get into school and your teens and stuff I don't know I, I find like when you're a kid yucks a young kid now what you want to be and it's like they say whatever but for whatever reason they think by the time they're in high school it's too far of a goal for them yeah because a society might have punched it out of them and that's one of the biggest things um that i'm so passionate about obviously i've used e-com e-commerce is the vehicle to to create the life of my dreams obviously i've still got so far to go but it's like i didn't even know what e-commerce was when i was in high school i didn't know all the possibilities and it's like whether you're in the mid-20s mid-30s mid-40s you can you still have what 50 years plus to live of your life you can still start today and start chasing whatever it is you want to chase but you made such a good point it's like if you start this vision of your life as a footy player from a kid and you, and you visualize it so strongly by the time you get into your teenage years you've already had that goal in your head for 10 years so it's a little bit harder to like get it out of you mm. straight away but as soon as people start having dreams and hopes as an adult you would know very easily that can be discouraged or doubt themselves was 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 like self-belief a big part of your process? Is it something that you gave yourself or did you have good support around you in terms of a family network and stuff? Yeah, same, same thing. I, I love looking at, you know, childhood. Like you, you hear of people and maybe they, yeah, got dreams knocked out of them and then it goes back to their childhood, like definitely patterns and things like that. And I, I look back super grateful. Like I was always a very confident kid and always – yeah, I, as I said, I had that one vision and I wasn't going to let anything stop me getting there. But I look at it now as well. I had support from my family, like my mum and dad. They're both immigrants. So I had that instilled like nearly like a military kind of mindset from a very young age, which now growing up, I realised that's why I am super disciplined and consistent. But then on the same breath, it's like, yeah, I had full support from them as well, like really fortunate parents were there. They, they never sort of split up as parents. They supported my footy ambitions. We grew up in Western Brisbane, so not much money, but they always made time and rattled off money for me to play footy. Mm. So I was only allowed to pick one sport um, and it was always footy and they supported that all the time. So it was like I had that backing from parental support plus always, uh, you know, my immigrant parents. Mum was from the Philippines, dad was from Poland, both come from nothing. So you sort of see that work ethic from a young age and you wrap it all up. I had a brother who was six years older than me, so I lost everything growing up. You know, he beat me up with everything. <laughs> We're super competitive though. So it's kind of – I love looking back at people's like childhood package and, and how they are, how they are. And for me, I really feel like, yeah, the, the competitiveness, the discipline and nearly that military standard set from my dad – but also the support and love from like my Asian, Asian mother kind of, yeah, wrapped up how it is with sport and mm -hmm. now obviously in business. But, yeah, for sport it was, it was a really, really good foundation. I feel very blessed that, you know, they supported me every step of the way. But, um, yeah, it's the old cliche. I, I still believe hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard because there was a heap of dudes a lot more talented than me. But – might have went off the rails, you know, in high school and different things like that. And then, yeah, they let their p potential go to waste. And what I find really interesting about what you just said, <clears throat> you said you're only allowed to play one sport and that was the dream, that was the one goal. Did you get sidetracked like a lot of kids do? I know myself looking back, it happens to adults, let alone kids, but so, so many kids can be like, I want to play this sport, then that's what I want to do, this, I want to do that. I, want, I would watch a TV series about whatever and I'd want to do that. I want to be a lawyer, then I'd want to be a cop. Then like I'd get, get so, you know, taken by, you know, the next cool idea. Did that ever happen to you or was it, did you, were you able to with, with that recipe of, you know, the love and support with that like discipline from your family, were you able to kind of block that out and just stay consistently focused on the one goal? I reckon it was pretty consistent and I think it comes from who was ahead of me as well. Like as I said, my brother lived and breathed it, my dad as well friends at school, obviously growing up in Western Brisbane. It's a sport you play out there as well. So it was kind of like it was just my environment. Mm. And as I said, it was one of those things I, I truly, truly felt like I, I was always going to play professionally. It was always a goal. There were some hurdles when I was 16 and then again when I was 18. So there were really big years for me to learn about resilience and it didn't look like it was going to happen. But, yeah, it, it, 
it is so true what they say around you know having resilience and being able to push through and if you want it bad enough you you make it happen man and, and to that um hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work thing you speak to anyone obviously i've been privileged enough to be able to speak to a lot of successful people in a lot of different realms um but quite a few sport people now and and, and, and some few artists and actors that sort of stuff and it's so funny it's all the people that make it have that same thing that they were so consistent for such a long period of time. They believed in themselves and they put the work in over years and years and years to make it happen. It's not like, oh, I decided I want to do this and two years later I'm playing professionally. Yeah. It's so much work that goes in behind it. But with like social media and this like instant gratification kind of yes. world we live in, that's getting a little bit lost now, I feel. Right. Uh, I love Alex Hormozzi. I don't know if you follow oh, her. Absolute G, yeah. He's the, he's the best. Oh, he's, anything man. he says, I'm like, fuck, I know, write that down. I know, man. I'm, I'm obsessed with him. Anyway, I love his framework around you can judge someone on their success based on their value on their time horizon and he judges a lot of people like how long are they looking for that success in business or whatever. And people say, you know, I've been doing this for, you know, one year consistently, I'm not getting results. And he said what he noticed from a lot of the most successful is – hey, I'm willing to put it in for at least a decade or so. So, and, and when I think about it, even with sport, like you play a sport from five years old, six years old, and then you debut at age 20, <laughs> that's 15 years in the making, right? So it, it does translate. And, it, and I guess that's why I love professional sport and athletes, like just the DNA of them and why I think a lot of them can be successful when they translate into business is because nothing's going to happen overnight and you're used to that. And even on a, on a micro level, like pre-season, like it, bro, it was like three months of just punish. There's no games coming up. There's nothing. It's just, you just rock. You just got to show up and do your best each day and um, the reward doesn't come. And then you play a season over 24 games or whatever it is. So that's another whole year of just, mm -hmm. you know, so there's nothing really gratifying straight away. Like it's not a quick, quick process. So yeah, I really like that analogy that Hormozzi says around, you know, you've got to be willing to do something for an extended period of time and, and enjoy the suck. Have, have you read Shoe Dog? No. Is that the Nike the Nike story. Yeah. You know, if you love that, you're going to love Shoe Dog. Really? It's my favourite oh, business book ever written. It's so – even even if you just – if you don't have – even if you're an audiobook guy, audiobook it, it's so okay. fucking good. Dude, Nike, the one of the biggest brands in the world, now worth however many billion – 10, 20 years they weren't profitable. They really? should have went out of business five, yeah. six times. The amount of adversity he had to overcome and he didn't start making proper profit to at least two decades in. Wow. Crazy. You'll love it. And you said something and it's a little bit jumping ahead, but I just want, while we're talking about it, I want to get your thoughts on that. It's like I've, I've noticed the same pattern where if people, whether it be sports or high achievers in, in another field, can so often, it's not guaranteed, but like how often athletes, for as an example, can then go on and apply what they've developed and the skills they've learned to business and be really successful. What do you think some of those key ingredients that you've developed, like as, as you said, over a decade, two decades almost as an athlete that you can apply to business? Well, the biggest thing that when I retired that I noticed, it was, a, it sounds funny, but I started obviously going back to, to everyday gym. Like you know, <laughs> it, was, it was weird. I'm like, well, I've got to get a gym membership, <laughs> man, and buy my own sports shoes and that again. So um, but when I'd go to the gym, I'd train at a good intensity and I realised like the average Joe, like, and I don't judge people on, on how they train, but I just noticed like when I trained with friends and stuff back in the real, the real world, so to speak, <laughs> um, yeah, it was like as soon as it got a bit tough, like it, it's like that next level, like we're so used as athletes to you can go beyond where it hurts. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm using training as an example, but honestly I believe – that skill alone, being able to, when it actually hurts, you just go to another level. Like my dad always gave me the analogy. It's probably not a great quote, but he's like, mate, you can't drop dead. Um, you know, so he's yeah. always like, you can go harder. So when I was training as a kid, you know, you see your heart rate at a certain level, you can actually go mm. push it a bit more. So, and it's just, when it starts to hurt, that's when it, we used to have this saying at the Titans in the altitude room, we used to train there and used to stare at it and it's like get comfortable being uncomfortable. So training starts when it gets uncomfortable. That That's when you start. So a lot of people I realised they stop when it just starts to hurt. Yeah, and I can relate to that uh, in, in my own way as well. I've been doing martial arts for seven years. I'm a black belt. Oh, hectic. And 
like it's two to three times a week, mainly three times a week, and it's an hour and a half to two hours of dude. I can't, I'm drenched mm. in sweat, like I've just been in the shower, and a lot of the time, like you go through phases where every like you love every moment of 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 the process and training as well. But there are times when I'm super busy with business, I have a lot of different things going on, and like it's still out. It's half an hour. It's out west, kind of where I grew up, but I still go to the same place because it's so good. And the reason I go there, even when it's so hard, and like I've got other things that I'd ideally like to spend my time on. It's because I know just me showing up and pushing my body yeah. to the absolute max and, and, and pushing to that point where you know you're going to suffer for at least the last 20 minutes, you're in the hurt locker. And doing that gives me so much more in the rest of my life. Yeah. So I would never give that up, that feeling. I think it's so good. And like you said, if you, if you know how much you can withstand under pressure, then it makes the everyday yeah. stuff so much easier, especially in business. Yeah, and, and I think that is the – the biggest key takeaway and something I've noticed transitioning from sport into business now is man, business is tough mm -hmm. business. It's I, I treat it again. This is my mindset. I, I'm waking up coming into the sport of business now. So I was in the sport of rugby league. Now I'm in the sport of business. It's just, it's competitive. It's tough. There's, there's ups and downs, just like it's emotional roller coaster. And I feel that, my you know decade long career pretty much has prepped me in a good foundation where you know we've scaled quite quickly and a lot of it was I had no skill but I believe 80% of it is what's upstairs in your mind and the ability to push it through when things get hard being able to deal with things under pressure is a common one there's not many jobs I found when I was an athlete that you're put under a certain amount of serious pressure at a young age mm -hmm. so I'm very grateful for that. You know, you're at 19, 20 years old. You're kind of in the spotlight. You've got criticism from, um, you know, your, not only your family but then your, the newspapers, then your coaches. And, man, what, what other industry can you directly say to someone at 20 years of age, like, fuck, that wasn't good enough. You're a joke. Like, you know, even, it's just, that's when you get nice cannot, you, Yeah, and that's in the, on the nice front. So it's kind of like – you look back, if you said that to an employee in the <laughs> workplace, it's just like you get done. So it's, um, yeah, it's just, and you, you're surrounded by, like my teammates in the locker room were 30 years old with kids and there's not many times when you're 18, 19 thrust in that space and you're hanging out with that mm. sort of characters everywhere. So it's not like, um, you know, you, you, it, was, it was like a bubble basically what I'm trying to say. So... Yeah, it's just funny that the comparison from sport to business is like huge and I'm so passionate around more athletes, not just rugby league but a lot of athletes, um, not losing their identity just with sport. I think that's the biggest thing I'm noticing is the identity shift that I had from being an athlete into now being an entrepreneur is I think too many athletes and a lot of my friends are going through this is they only see themselves as an athlete. Did you, did you have to go through much uh, adversity before the end of the career? Did you suffer like injuries before the, the final one? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. So my first three years, you know, I was basically injury free and ha having a great old time, you know, winning man of the matches, those sorts of things. And then, yeah, unfortunately a few injuries come and I ended up having about nine surgeries all back to back over a short period of time. So, you know, shoulder recos, knee reco, ankle scopes, hip scopes. So, yeah, it was battled, battled and bruised. But the thing is, you keep showing up, you do your rehab, get back on the field, and you get on with the job. So, it, it was tough, and and um, yeah, that I felt that period of my career where it was really hard emotionally because obviously I wanted to get back on the field full time. I think has really helped me from a resilience point of view. That hey, you get knocked down, you can get back up and yeah, keep, keep sort of going. Because it was when you were at the Titans, like you said, you were surrounding yourself with people 10 years older than you who had been earning decent money for a while. That was when you first started investing in property, right? Talk to me about how that first started. Were you already thinking about real estate when you got there or how did that come up? Yeah, not really. See, my family, obviously, mum from Philippines, dad from Poland, both immigrants come from nothing. They just worked hard, paid the one house off and, that's it, you know, so investing wasn't on the table. Uh, a lot of the mindset around money growing up was very tight, you know, it's scarce, doesn't grow on trees, you know, I wasn't allowed, to, I got all the hand-me-downs from my brother. So for me it was it was not spoken about, it was something you didn't want to speak about. So when I got into first grade, I guess two parts, first part is I was really blessed, I feel I didn't waste money because it was so tight at home and 
I seen mum and dad be really tight with it. So that was one. I was a good saver. And then second to that was I believe I had the discipline to, you know, not go out drinking with my mates and blow 300 bucks on a night out or whatever. So um, it was always around, yeah, those key habits uh, were formed. But then hanging with older dudes, you, they start talking in the locker room around buying houses and stuff like that. So I remember at age, uh, yeah, age, age 20, just started having some conversations with some of the guys who were in their 30s, 32, 33. And, yeah, they got me sort of kick-started on that journey into my first house at 22. So, um, yeah, with that, I, I, get, I don't know where, again, if I was surrounded by maybe people who are doing different things with their money at that age, it could have been a, a different story. And um, talk to me about the decision to step away from footy. You obviously had a pretty serious industry, uh, I- I injury. What was going through your head then? What was the injury you were dealing with? And, and then did you know straight away that it was going to be real estate where you'd go after footy? No. Nah, so it was a, I remember in my last year, I think it was 2016, I did my ACL in round two. So, and it really hurt that one because round one, I had the, I was coming off contract and that's always a big year if you're an athlete. Yeah, you're basically what that means is essentially you, your contract. And if you don't perform that year, you're not guaranteed a job at the end of that year. So I probably was come. I was coming off a uh, shoulder reconstruction. I knew I was on my last year, so I gave preseason my all. And first two trial games played really well. One man in the match round one, and then round two did my ACL, and I was like, man, that's that's tough coming off back to back injuries as well. That was my last shot. ACL found out and. They're not a short-term injury. They're, it's a year gone. So for me, I was like, shit, that's, this is probably it, you know, coming off contract. Um, told multiple times to retire from surgeons and doctors. So I had a good look at where I was and I was really fortunate. It was round two. So my pay was going to stop in October that year. I got injured in around April. So I basically had, you know, five months to, to get – my post footy career sorted. I had some deals over in the UK I could go to, but I knew, man, I'm, I'm pumped for what's next. So yeah, did my uh, real estate license while I was still getting paid from the club, did all that with my rehab. And then, yeah, when the pay stopped in October, I basically cold called a few uh, real estate firms and landed myself a gig and yeah, the rest is sort of history there, but it, it wasn't around it was just kind of fell into it. I, I bought a few properties when I was playing footy just from investing and stuff and it was kind of – I could feel myself leaning towards that industry and as an athlete I missed out on a few jobs as well which was tough and I say this to a lot of athletes. When you retire, your resume is empty. Hmm, yeah, yeah, you get, it breaks the ice, you know, you're on TV and NRL and that but at the end of the day, man, if you ain't qualified, you, it's, it's hard tough, to get a yeah. job, man. So, um, yeah, you got these guys fresh out of school – retired at 35 man the, the resume is empty mm. so it's um it's something i'm really passionate about showing some of the younger guys that use that time wisely to get some degrees up your sleeve or even work experience i think it's super important so yeah i, I did work experience that last year for free while i was juggling rehab did my degree um got my full license and yeah and then just transition straight into the industry how do you think because I know a lot of athletes struggle with this, the identity thing when they're getting close to the end of the career yeah. or post-career. How do you think, because obviously it, you'd already had a, a, quite a few serious injuries, but you were 26. You know, if you really wanted to, you could have worked, you could have got back in there, whether you had to play a year in Cup or go over to England, you could have. What made you think that, no, I'm comfortable with what I've done and I'm excited about the next chapter? I think it was the identity thing, in all honesty, and it was really hard to let go of. And, I mean, I see a lot of players now that, I played with and, and guys where that I feel like they're just hanging on to the the career because there is nothing else. So for me, it was a big one shifting away from. No, I'm not just an athlete. I have got a lot of skills that I feel I'm confident in and transitioning away from. I'm confident talking in front of people and um, you know I can read and write and do those sorts of things. I, I, I just really want to give something else a, a crack, but it's really hard to let go of the identity of being an athlete so I think that's the biggest barrier any athlete faces is there's a small window that you are an athlete so wrap your head around that it's not going to be there forever so you can't even you can't attach yourself to that and it's it's fact as well like they even say like the bigger profile you are the harder it is like 
you know, unfortunately you heard of guys like Greg Inglis and guys like that, like he's an absolute goat, but, you know, he struggled post-career with depression and things like that because of, yeah, it, it, it is a hard, hard thing to, to let go of and move away from. And you can't replicate the highs you get from being an athlete at that level to anywhere really in normal life. I think that's the biggest thing that people struggle to let go of and I know this for myself, there's not many – industries or jobs where you have that much adrenaline and competitiveness ever again and that's okay it's it, i think it's being able to accept that i've accepted that i'll never have a high like i i did playing at that level i'll never be able to be that competitive physically with someone <laughs> again you know and that, that's totally okay. probably good the the physical part for yeah that. yeah yeah but what i learned with business is the mental competitiveness and the mental drain and things like that you can get that stimulation from from things outside of sport and i think that's where the guys struggle they they sort of end up in jobs that are just paying the bills but they can get that same stimulation in in something else it's so crazy though man like i just played footy like a normal person right i haven't played footy for 10 years and i still have dreams that i'm playing footy and I'm, <laughs> yeah. fuck, i would love to get back out there but honestly it's not worth me getting yes. injured because i know i would i'm not i'm not cut out for that shit anymore but yeah. oh it's it's hard to let go of even as just a sport lover so mm. i can only imagine coming from that pinnacle um to then being okay with not having those highs again and i think it's I think obviously that's an extreme example, but there's other examples when people change life direction. Oh. It doesn't have to be sport. It can be whatever. If, you, yeah. if you're someone who's always been in, in a really safe industry, an accountant, or you're working in a big corporate company as a lawyer, and then you think, you know what? You've, you've noticed I'm actually, I'm, I'm not happy. And I, I want to pivot. I want to do something for myself. And, I'm, and it means starting again. I'm not going to be able to show up and now I'm going to get my 80 grand or 100 grand, or 120 grand in the year. It's like, I need to create something for myself. Mm. And that's a big shift that people have to go through themselves as well. So I think around those changes in life can be quite difficult. Um, but I want to ask you just because I wanna really want to dive into all the property stuff as well, because that's what, you know, you such from everything I see from you, so such a genius when it comes to this stuff. You know your stuff so well. So I want to pick your brain on that. But I just want to know one last thing about that moment of, of, of deciding to, to move on. It's like, do you feel that achieving your dream, which was your lifelong dream, kind of gave you the self-belief that, hey, if I did that, I can go and be successful in this. I can kind of do anything. Pretty much, yeah. I say it to myself a lot of the time when there were them low moments and feelings of ill confidence and what next when I, I knew I was going to retire. But then I sort of always peel myself from a macro view and look. I remember growing up, you know, age 15, 16, you know, them big school carnivals, you know, there's thousands of kids and you hear the talks with, you know, scouting guys and recruitment and they, they, they see tell it to you straight. Probably only one or two of you out of the thousand here will actually play professional sport. And, you know, you just think, no, I'm, I'm definitely playing. And like <laughs> every other kid's thinking that as well. Yeah, yeah. So to actually make it – you're in a very small minuscule percent to play professionally. So I carry that, I, I call it like a top 1% mentality with me everywhere. And I always say to myself, in sport, I had to do things that 99% of people weren't doing. So if they were going out partying, I, I was training and I remember uh, a lot of my teammates and things, I remember at 18 we graduated, they all went to schoolies and I trained the next morning. I didn't, didn't go and I never experienced schoolies and, I look back now and it's like, man, I'm, that's what it's all about. Whether that would have executed me playing NRL or not, it's like them little mm. moments of, no, I'm going to choose this because that everyone else is doing that. I'm going to do something different. I, I love those moments too. Obviously, um, I've been in business now for five years um, since we launched. The last two years have been a little bit more normal, obviously, because when you're in the build phase, it's yeah. all in, <laughs> no weekend. Well, a little bit of week, but you sacrifice yeah. so much. And I looked, I was actually talking about this last week. I look back at all the things I had to sacrifice so fondly Yes. because that's why I got to where I am today. And now mm. I can, you know, travel more. I can go to the things on weekends. I can do all that. But for those like first three, three and a half years, I had to sacrifice so much. And I almost didn't realize at the time how much I was sacrificing mm. because you, you're just so you're just in the zone. You're so in the yeah. zone. You're so committed to the vision and what you want your life to be and creating that. And I think that's the best like life to be successful, to get to where you want to be if you're not already there. You have, there's going to be sacrifices, but if you can look at them sacrifices, and this is like a little hack for me, it's like, if you can look at those sacrifices as like a really exciting thing, mm. I feel like it helps because sometimes I'll be, I'll be in the office, I might get to the office at 8am 
and I'm still there at 11.30 and I've, I know I've got to be up at six the next day and I'm tired, but I've still got these things I need to do. And I start thinking, oh, I really wish I didn't have to do that. Then I catch myself and realize, no, this is what makes a winner. This is what makes people get yeah. to live that life and build that business. So I actually then like, as much as I'm feeling tired in that moment, it gives me so much more motivation to be like, no, fuck this. This is, this is what I should be doing. And this is why you become successful mm. when you can make yourself do these things that, like you said, the other 99% wouldn't really want to do. I wouldn't want to do to that extent because you can't, can't control how talented you are, how intelligent you are. You can't control the, where you were born and, and the connections and the money that your family had, but you can control how hard you work and how, how much you want to get to where you want to go. Mm, I heard this one and really related there around discipline deposits, <laughs> daily discipline deposits. And it's those deposits each day that are actually the things that will separate you. So little thing like I love my cold therapy and cold showers and, you know, eating the good food for most of the week. And it might seem like the minuscule things, but it's the discipline to be able to do it over and over and over. That is the compounding effect that separates you, I think, from being where you are to where you want to be. And like they always say, the, the most successful aren't the most talented. It's just they have that innate ability to do the boring things and execute. Like mm -hmm. not for one week, one month or one year. It's like they could do it for a really, really long time. Yeah, and I think it, it, it all comes down to how long you can do those things for, right? The patience element. Now, you patience, would have heard Gary yeah. B talk about that a thousand times. Patience, patience, patience. And I don't think you necessarily... And I know this for a fact, and this is what I used to look at when I was building the, the business the first time with my mate. I used to say, no disrespect, all these people who weren't the smartest people, but they had their own businesses just because they took a chance started mm. them. When necessarily that smart, but they're killing it. I don't think you need to be that smart in business. You need to be really persistent. But if it's not going well for you, you need to be smart enough to at least look around at what you're doing, what the people that are being successful are doing, and, and make adjustments until it does start to work. Mm. But it's not, it's not rocket science business. Mm. You don't have to be a genius. And now I want to ask about your, because obviously you're a buyer's agent now. I want to explore all of that and what, what you do today. But what, how long were you on, on, on the seller side as like a, a more of a traditional agent? What was that experience like? And what were the kind of the things that happened along the way that made you think, hey, I can actually add a lot more value if I step over and represent the buyer's side? Yeah, it was interesting. When I transitioned to working for the seller, like a sales agent, what that taught me was, well, firstly, if you're, Looking for a job to get you out of your comfort zone, dude, become a real estate agent, man. It yeah. is an absolute grind. Everyone thinks it's easy. Man, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done, cold call and reject. But the key takeaways I took from that industry, I did it for 12 months basically from scratch. I was my own agent. I got to a point at the 12-month mark and I either had to go you know, put an associate on because we are getting bigger or I was like, no, nah, I'm going to pivot and transition. And, and in that 12-month journey, I realised – the need for buyers advocacy, like helping buyers was huge, especially on Queensland. Sydney and Melbourne had buyers agents and buyers advocates bubbling. They're a bit more ahead. Um, but Queensland, we're, we're always a bit behind you guys. So um, there was barely any buyer representation on the uh, in Queensland, especially on the Gold Coast. So that's where I made that leap. I was like, man, it's in a huge gap in the market. I, I actually enjoy the buying side better. So I jumped on that side. But the things I took away, it wasn't a waste of time doing the seller side because what it did, it taught me around commute. I can't, got to remember, I come off being an athlete, no skills in the workforce. Wouldn't have been doing too many emails back in the day. Nothing, man. So I learned how to obviously turn on a computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the big ones were being able to deal with rejection. So as an athlete, you're used to that all the time, but, you know, you're not picked, you pick, whatever. But you're used to everyone knowing who you are and those things, but, man – when you're cold calling and you're dealing with rejection constantly. So that was one, the, the learning of process. So again, my, some of my mentors in that industry, they'd make X amount of cold calls. It wasn't the outcome of how many got through to a result. It was, did you do them? Mm. Did you, and, and did you do it over the week, over the year? Like tick, tick the box. That was, that was a big one. And then the third thing was understanding the game of negotiation and understanding how it all works. And it's a lot of it is a people game so it's not so much around the actual property it's around being able to create win-win scenarios for all parties involved and i love the psychology side of the negotiation and, and the people aspect so yeah i just transferred all of that combined it with the sport disciplines and background and then yeah i fell into 
my own business and and I listen to all the podcasts like yourself, you know, all the business podcasts, Mark Bohr, all that sort of Gary V's and Mosey and I just loved business. I had no business but I just loved business. So it was the only real industry or, or sector of the industry that I was like, yeah, I'm going to start my own business in this. I was always like, should I do e-commerce? Should I start up a service base? And I just didn't know what. And then that led me into I was definitely going to start a business, but I just didn't know what it was. And then I was like, yep, there's the gap. I'm just going to attack it. And, and like with real estate as well, I imagine compared to some industries like engineering, it's not, it's not the hard, it's not full of complicated things. But if you can nail the process, it's so, and then obviously the, the, the people side, the human skills, you can absolutely kill it. And that's the thing. All agents know kind of what you're meant to do and all the same mm. things. But why do some people make, Millions of dollars commission a year and some mm. barely make any yeah. process. Mate, you pretty much nailed it. I, I believe the three biggest key traits to make it successful in the real estate industry, whether it sales or the buying side, I believe is yeah being able to understand, to focus on process, not outcome. That's probably number one and having the discipline to do it. Uh, number two would be understanding human behavior and having a good emotional IQ. And the third would be understanding the the long game approach. So not looking, I always say build relationships, not transactions. So if you focus on the next transaction, but you burnt three people in the process, you've missed the long game approach. You're not looking five, ten years ahead. You're looking at the right now. How do you how do you develop that mindset as well? Because I agree and I feel like logically a lot of people will agree, but I feel like there's some sort of um, lack mindset or insecurity that makes people they, their logical brain switches off like, no, I need to get that done. But it's, when you zoom out just a little bit, it's so clear that that's actually going to hurt you long term. Oh, man, 100%. I think it is being able to have a helicopter view of where you are as well. And that's why I always say the mindset of long game mindset, macro mindset, because, again, even, even when people are looking at property, they're looking at property from like a very small, minuscule part. Like they're not looking at the long term aspect of it. And I think – in this industry, like if you burn someone today, you might not feel it straight away, but that that's going to burn you yourself and your business on the back end mm-hmm. tenfold in five, ten years' time. So there's been plenty of times I've stepped away from money to protect a relationship and it, it pays off every single time. We were just talking about process and now rega- obviously you're in the, the property industry, I'm in e-commerce, the two, two of the major things to, to, to take your business to the next level is – Time management and prioritization. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Because it's so universal. And if, if no matter what their business is, regardless of what industry, whoever's listening, if you can nail, if you can improve your prioritization and time management, you'll get infinite amount more done. Mate, it's a, it's a big one. And I think it's nearly everything. I think calend- being able to, I'm constantly, every quarter, I'm always looking at how's my calendar management. I've now got the discipline to stick to it, but am I putting the right things in the calendar? One thing I've learned is to use a calendar very diligently to manage my time. The second is to understand are you busy being busy or are you busy putting things in place to move you to the next step? I find a lot of people can get caught up busy being busy. Like they're, they're doing – I've got a really good framework that we got off um, – uh, what's his name? Um, I had a, had a mind blank. I'll, I'll think of it in a second. What's the – Self growth dude, and he wears the vest. You know, um, Aussie guy. Self. He, he wear, always wears the vest, muscly dude. Oh. Kerwin? Kerwin Ray. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> Kerwin Ray. Um, I, I did one of his one, Nail It or Scarlet. Yeah. And, okay. and uh, his little framework around, um, you know, he sets 12 month, quarterly, daily kind of things. And then I combined it with something I heard from um, Ice, got it from somewhere, Isaac John from YKTR. I heard on one of his podcasts, HPAs, High Profit Actions. Mm. So I've combined them two and that's really – when we started doing that, it really turned the needle for our business. So our key thing is each team member has three HPAs, three high profit actions for the day. So it's not responding to X email or whatever. It's like high profit action. It's like moving the deal along or, you know, getting that relationship closed in on just things that are going to really move the business forward and if you can finish the day ticking those three hbas like you've 
you've put yourself in a better position moving forward. And, and then those three things, are they the priorities for the day? It, exactly right, yeah. Like everyone's got a to-do list, right? But where do you start? And it's always around choose the three biggest priorities that are going to move your business forward and, and your role as well. So as a founder, I find it's important for me to show leadership and everyone's got a role to play within a team. Like if we relate to footy, my winger isn't going to do the job of the prop and the, the dummy half isn't going to do the fullback's job. So it's around making sure the team know their their roles and then within them roles, what are your HPAs? So, again, related to sport, like a winger is, you know, catching the high ball, taking that first carry and score on the try. Like just focus on, focus on that. You don't need to worry too much around the gritty stuff in the middle. So I think it translates so well into business. Um, you know, I see a lot of people busy being busy, but just break it down into three – solid actions for the day and then if you hit them then you can um, move on to the, the next to-do list yeah i've kind of fallen into that uh, as well too um more out of necessity than idea like i've heard it all before we've all heard that yeah. right but it's especially i was 24 when i started the business you're figuring you're growing faster than i'm guys we grew faster than i knew what to do with all of a sudden we had a team of like 12, I'd never managed a team of two, you know, I had like at the gym, but like not, yeah. not, 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 nothing seriously. And like you're growing so fast and it's kind of, you know how you hear information, but you're not ready to hear it mm. until you're really in that, in that place. And yeah, something that's helped me a lot because I do have a, a multiple projects going on and I just won't have the time to get to the whole to-do list. So I've been, I've been doing that a lot with myself. Just if I can get three things done today, three most important things, not replying to the emails, not responding to all the DMs, whatever. What are the three things that are going to move me, my businesses, the four the most? And if I can do them and it's only those three things, I'll be extremely happy. But I think you've just taken it to the next level for me as well as like, obviously, because I do that because I'm the founder and, and the director of these businesses. But for people that have a team, breaking that down because, okay, for someone in customer service, they're not going to understand what it's like to run a business and what really moves the needle for. But if I can analyze each part of the, my, my business or anyone can do this with each part of their business and think for that role, what three things can they yeah. focus on that is actually going to affect profitability or, or success of your business and you make that clear for them and make them nail those three things. I think that's something really smart and um, yeah, something you just gave me. So thanks. Yeah, for that. no, as I said, I fell in it because of sport again. Yeah. Like if I was caught trying to go on the wing and not, you know what I mean? The <laughs> yeah, coach yeah, yeah. the Hey, what the fuck are you doing out there? So it's my job as a dummy half was I need to get the go forward for the middles. I need to give good service to my halves when shape's on and I need to defend my ass off in the middle and hold like glue. And like that was basically all I needed to do. So simple. Mm. And I love watching the Melbourne Storm um, because hey, they get any battlers from any club and they make them a superstar. <laughs> Nearly every time. Yeah, you know because you relate it to business, right? They've got the system. And you just plug in these people and Bellamy, I've heard, I've never been coached from him, but guys who I played with from there, they say it's like they've got the business ops running Perfectly, and you find yeah. the right people who are culturally right to plug in and he'll train them. But if they're culturally not right, they don't touch them. And I, I look back now at my journey when I was at the Titans, we had a system but we weren't getting the right culture fits in. So gun players, poor culture. So, man, there was a oh, – you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to say it. Like, yeah, there were some years we under-delivered on our performance on roster, but now looking back, man, poor culture fit. Like, terrible. And Melbourne – on paper looks scrappy but they show up because everyone look and they and they all, when when they do go move on eventually their leaders at their new clubs nico Hines is an amazing hey. example like wild man. how much better nick meany's got from going for the bulldogs who i support wild to the melbourne man. storm great player now and then just on that culture piece obviously can only take you so far but all you need to do is look at the dolphins their oh, start. Man, that's it's cool, all though. culture yeah. it's all you know that uh, bennett mentality because if you compare them to the teams they've beat like compare them to the roosters squad Amount of talent there. and the Roosters, you know, they've got. I'm not saying they don't have a great culture, but it just yep. shows how important that can be, mate. And it's funny, like now knowing what I learn about business and scaling now, because I feel starting a business and then scaling a business are complete two different complete things, as as you know, man. But now I'm looking back at sport, exact same framework. Like the best coaches are man managers and culture leaders, and they outsource the technician Technical work stuff. To the the assistant coaches, like there's a, a every team now has an attack coach, 
defense coach, a wrestle, wrestle S and C strength and conditioning. The coach at the top, he's nearly like overseeing and putting forward, and then he just comes in and gives the tap. That's what they reckon the Wayne Bennett mentality is. Man, he just he listens to you, puts your hand around you when you need a cuddle, and he'll he'll kick you up your ass when you need a drive, and then everyone respects him and they want to play for him. But he's not doing the drills, man. He's just man managing the the system. So I find that really interesting now. I learnt about business. It's like, wow, looking at footy, it's the exact same process. Have you incorporated that of you as, as you've built your own team? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, and it's hard because that was my whole life. So, uh, man, the, my team probably sick of all my footy analogies. <laughs> but, um, yeah, man, I, I use it for everything. And it's like I've got an operations manager. He's like my – my integrator right and he's like my assistant coach and he needs to look after those players and that and he knows when someone needs a cuddle and and he'll inform me and then you know make me aware and yeah it's all it's all part of it so it's uh it's funny it it translates so much but one thing i'm really big on and i've learned off some mentors in the business space is that word culture again and i used to think it was a bit of a woo-woo when i was playing footy we do all these leadership culture things and it's like oh waste of time but you look back now melbourne are where they are because of culture and like roosters have always been a strong club good culture within them they all want to be a part of the culture so now as a business we've had a lot of people uh, i've had made some bad highs and stuff and some really good ones and the good ones are always culture cult- first yeah, yeah. culture first yeah and the more i'm learning and often now high entrepreneurs everyone keeps going back to people it's all the people people and one of my favorite quotes that's really stuck with me is a good leader can get things done through other people. So it's being able to delegate and, and show the plan and the mission and then being able to get the people within the team to want to move for that mission and for the founder. Like you hear so many people, they don't leave jobs because they didn't enjoy They left because they didn't like how they were being managed. So I find culture and leadership is nearly that next phase for me in business to to learn more and dive deeper into it's 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 a topic that uh, it, it's like building teams is something you can get so right or so wrong and obviously you read the book rocket fuel on uh, yeah i, I love from, that one yeah. yeah it's really interesting really good book um i think it's so important as well and i think that's why i've worked really well with joe joe's a partner in one of the new businesses i've launched not the one i was speaking to you about because like joe's a really good integrator he just get under, gets mm. things done you know what i mean the people that can just go in and get yep. shit done i think it does a really good job and I didn't notice, realize that like a few years ago before I read the book and realized, yeah, I'm definitely not an integrator. That's not where my skills lie. Um, so it's really important to find the right people to compliment you and the team. Now, I could speak to you about business and footy all day, but I want to last, you know, let's say 15 minutes, really want to focus on property. Yeah, man. Piggy brain on, 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 on that world because market's changing all the time. We're getting at that age. A lot of my friends now are looking to buy first property or maybe the first investment property after they're buying and living one. But you're, you're a buyer's agent. Now talk to me a little bit about what that means and, w- and what you do and what do you think for a lot of people that, that go to a buyer's agent like yourself and you can help them out with, what is it in the process that they don't understand or that they can get wrong when trying to do it alone? Yeah, so the easiest analogy I use for anyone that doesn't know what a buyer's agent is, is like unlike a real estate agent who works for the seller, we're the opposite. We work exclusively for the buyer. So we're paid for and work for the buyer only. So we take a client's brief on, they tell us what they want and need and then we basically go out and find it. And what I find the biggest pain points are essentially in the process is understanding value, number one, so quantifying value. So I find a lot of people in Australia when the markets are hot and cold, they, it's hard to know what a property is actually worth, like true value. That's probably number one. Second is, I don't know about you, but the way society is going, everyone's getting more time poor. <laughs> Like everyone wants to outsource thing. Everyone's everything needs to be quicker and faster and I'm too busy or, and buying property now is becoming one of those things where I believe if you want to buy well, there's a difference between just buying a property, but buying it well. And to buy well, you need to be able to do the extensive due diligence and understand what it's worth and negotiate. And um, so it's a full-time job in my opinion. So that's one thing a lot of people are outsourcing now is they said time poor. They, their dollar per hour is more valuable at their business or at their workplace and then they outsource the process to us and just come in and look at the property and feel it emotionally rather than you know juggling all the agents managing all the inspections and and whatnot 
So that's a, that's a big one. And then third is just confidence. A lot of people, it's, it's nearly the biggest – for the first home buyers, it's you save up a deposit and you're about to let go of a big chunk of money, right? And for investors, you've pulled equity, you've made some money. Now how do you maximise and, and grow it? And for a lot of people, it's scary – and without confidence or someone holding your hand or, or just telling you clarity-wise, hey, you're doing the right thing, I find a lot of people uh, don't take action as well. Like that's a that's a big one I find in this industry is a lot of people kind of know what to do sometimes or they feel they're on the right path, but they're just they're scared. They're they're scared to take take action. So a lot of people will pay us for the clarity and help to give them opportunities on a platter to them and, and just sort of advise them which way to go on that. I wanted to, I actually wrote down when I was doing some research and you, and you just kind of mentioned it. Talk to me about your, your acronym for fear, because I, I find that, you know, the, the fear acronym, mm-hmm. I, I heard you say that. I'm like, that's so fucking universal, not just with property, but tell us a little bit about that and how it relates to, to property. Yeah. If you're applying to the one false evidence appearing real. Yeah. So that's a, that's a big one. I think false evidence appearing real. So even with, Property man, like I'll, the amount of times I'll see people talk themselves out of a, an, a killer deal. Like on the table, one of my mentors growing up when I was starting investing in property, I always ask him, when's the best time to buy? And he said to me, Matt, the best time to buy is when there's a deal. If there's a deal, there's a deal. And so I sort of said, well, what do, what do you mean? And he sort of used the analogy. He said, look, if there's a Ferrari out the front right now and it was $500 you know, cash, no, no. There's nothing shonky going on. It's legit. 500 bucks. Would you buy it? And I said, yeah. And he's like, the reason you'd buy it is because you've, you know, the quantified value of that is, you know, 200K and you're getting it at a discounted rate. So whether you hold it or resell it, you're going to be in a better net position. So with property, people are scared of whether interest rates are going up, down, left or right. But some of our best deals have been bought in a hot market. Some of our best deals have been bought in a cold market. One thing I say is don't worry about the noise on the outside. Worry about the actual deal itself. Yeah, so when you're looking for a good deal, because this is where, where I feel like a lot of people would get that head noise and start overthinking things. It's like when you're looking to buy a good deal, let's just say the market's hot. Are you looking for a good deal when the market's hot and you're not worrying about what may happen in the future? Because no one can really predict these market cycles, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's like is it a good deal at the time? Regardless if it's hot or cold, is that kind of how you like to approach it? Pretty much, yeah. Well, the first is you've got to be able to quantify value, number one, because people say, oh, that sounds – we bought really well. And I say, what did you base that valuation on? Like what, is it just what the agent told you? <laughs> he said it was 900 and you paid 800 so you think it's a good deal. But when you look on the back end and do the research, it's, it's a 750 asset every day of the week. So that's probably number one. You need to know what something's worth. And that's why I use the Ferrari example. If you know something is circa – x value and you're picking it up for x value here it makes sense from a deal you, as long as you do your due diligence around it you've got to be able to act so the the thing with property is a lot of people aren't quantifying value first it's probably number one but the the key thing is what's the purpose as well like in a in a rising market you've got to be you got to be mindful of overpaying due to competition right so that that's a big one people I found during COVID and post 2020, you know, the market was pumping. So a lot of confidence comes in. Here's a funny one. A lot of the astute investors I know, and and I I didn't buy in that market. I I just sat back and let my assets all went up. But now the market's gone cool, interest rate, and and you'll notice on the news and the sentiment is all around interest rates, you know, inflation and scare. Mate, I know I work with some very high net worth individuals, mate, they're they're geared up. Their equity is pulled in the trigger, ready to pop, like yeah. big time. Like, and, and why is that so? Like, again, it goes back to what we said at the very start. You need to be doing what the 99% aren't doing because right now you can buy in isolation rather than in competition before. Mm. And it's weird. People would rather buy in comp- – the, the masses would rather buy in competition because it's a confident environment. Because they feel comfortable with They feel that. comfortable. No one wants to buy now when the, the they're – when literally, as I said, the deal, that deal flow in terms of the Ferrari analogy, instead of one being available on the table, mate, there's about 10 to 15 at any one point. Mm. So it's like, but the scary thing is you're buying in a high interest rate environment. You, so again, you need to know your due diligence. Have you done your buffer um, calculations with what's in there? Do you know what it's worth? Um, 
are you buying in a market that is not just built off, you know, high yield? You need to have the capital growth and the yield as well. So it's around. I'm not de- definitely not saying you, you should just go out there when everyone's fearful. It's if you do your due diligence, you've got the processes behind you. You know what constitutes a good deal. You need to be able to act when generally most of the time the the best time to buy is when the market's fearful. It's the old Warren Buffett, right? It's it. Um, be greedy when others are fearful, and then be fearful when others are greedy. Yeah, I've one of my um, one of my mates used to work with uh, his um, his wife now her partner. Oh, sorry. His his her part his wife's dad right. Mm. Um, really nice suburb um, just north of the bridge, uh, Milsons Point area. Just after the GFC, they bought a property right right above um, the Harbour Bridge, just up a little bit for like three million dollars. Mm. We're talking. This was like I was working with him a couple of years ago. It was worth like sixteen million. In the space of like 10 years. Wow. Again, like you can't encourage people to, to do, but that's when you can get the real fucking, the really big gains, you know what I mean? Yep. So it's like as someone now with a bit of cash stacked, I probably haven't gone as far into investing as I want, but I'm really getting ready for to do something maybe this year, next year. Now, what are some of your investment protocols that you that you look at for people that that might might be like myself looking to start taking investing a little bit more seriously? All right, a few big ones. Probably my first one is it's all about your land to asset ratio. That's my biggest one. So land to asset ratio is think of a house as being 100% land to asset ratio. A duplex is 50%. Say uh, you're in a unit block of eight, you're a one and eighth owner. At the end of the day, you've got to remember land, the dirt is what goes up in value. It's actually not the taps and the shiny cushions inside. It's, it's literally the, the piece of dirt. So... Um, that's number one. You've got to understand the the thing that going up is the thing you can't see underground because they're not making any more of it worldwide. So, you know, it's you know, I mean, it's a scarce asset. It's it's like anything in business, right? Supply and demand. So that that's number one. Number two is location will do 80% of the heavy lifting. So don't be backing in areas where there's still a lot of land to go or less desirable locations. You really want to be getting to areas that are driven through human behavior. Like there's there's employment there, there's schools, there's cafes, there's gentrification and uplift. 80% will do the heavy lifting. So it's as simple as that on a really macro scale is finding a good location that has the fundamentals behind it and then trying to find something with the highest land to asset ratio within that good location. So if you can't – say, for instance, where we're sitting now, Sydney, it's always performing well because it's scarce. Mate, you, you look above, there's no green anywhere to build anything anymore. It's super – population's growing, so supply and demand. Now, if you were to buy a house, it's X amount. If you were to buy a duplex, it's – you know what I mean? So it's all around what can your budget afford. You got that number. Now look at the location, then look at their land to asset ratio and what that budget can do for you. And then – how do you obviously there's different stages that you're investing uh say portfolio as it builds you're going to and prioritize different things but talk to me about um capital growth versus rental yield and, and the considerations at what stages of the cycle should people be focusing on the capital growth um possibilities potential versus rental yield for cash flow and that sort of stuff i really believe and as i said this isn't financial advice because everyone's got their different opinion but from my personal experience and working with some really um, successful investors is a lot of the early journey in their portfolio is based on capital growth and then they shift into cash flow and then it finally shifts into what I like to call debt reduction deals, DRDs. That's where it's at. So that three phase I find is a good blueprint and that's what I'm trying to focus on at the moment is early on in the piece in my 20s was all around capital growth. So one key quote that I got from my mentors is capital, um, cash flow helps you hold a portfolio. Capital growth is what make you generationally wealthy because people don't make generational wealth through cash flow. They get that through the capital growth they've made over time. But you do need both. You do need both. So there'll be a pivot career. There'll be a pivot property in your portfolio. And generally it's around number three to five where the bank's not going to lend you any more money. So you need more servicing, which can come from cash flow or starting, starting a business to boost your income. 
So that's the biggest thing I find. I, I see too many people focus on cash flow right from the start, but then they're relying on their income growth to basically save up a deposit to go again. Where if you focus on capital growth, let the market push the price up. And if I've got three pillars I'll talk about in a sec on what, you know, what I look for in a property. If you hit those three with a property, you can recycle the equity and go straight into the next one, yeah. capital growth. So that's where capital growth is really handy. It's that equity release and recycle. Um, when you're younger especially, I, I think focus on capital growth 100%. Um, and then you'll definitely feel the fruit of it in a decade's time. But again, everyone wants to get rich tomorrow. So it's really hard to say to someone, look, I'm telling you, and if you buy well with a capital growth property, the, the things you'll be able to leverage off that one property in a decade, you're not going to believe it. But it, it's hard to look a decade forward, right? And with it, with when I know this, there's no exact answer, but generally if you're looking at uh, – a property with a, a good chance at in, in a good location with a good land to asset ratio with a, a good you know potential for that capital growth is it often you're going to be potentially negatively geared a little bit more is that generally how you find it work in market or are there some opportunities to balance that kind of in between well this is a big one right like if you just say we're here in sydney and or you're living in melbourne right as a first home buyer or first time investor it's quite ex it's a big entry point like to get a good asset you could go super regional and bank on something but you're better off i feel getting into like more metro city areas um, with good capital growth now this is why i'm so big on like you need to either go um investment or owner occupier because when you get in that gray zone of like oh look i, I like this area because i live here and i really want to invest in here like if it's investing it's investing if it's something to live in, it's something to live in because two different outcomes. One's emotional, one's logical, red brain. So you really have – that's probably number one. I see a lot of younger people sort of cross the two over and it's really important to, to separate both of them because if you can do that, you can buy non-emotionally. And as a youngster, it, that's one of the biggest things I find. People attach too much emotion to the deal. And that's where you will overpay. You will get buyer's remorse or buyer's fatigue. So if you can do it with, like a business, like look at the numbers, be non-emotional about it. That's really going to help you. So, um, but yeah, it, if you're looking at like Sydney and Melbourne, high entry point, you're going to need a big salary to get in there. Like that's where a lot of markets like the Gold Coast, Brisbane as well, still strong cities, but the, the entry price to get into that area is a lot lower and the yield compression is still pretty good. So um, I'd be looking at places like that um, as, a, as a start if you were looking for blue chip locations. Yeah, because for people that maybe the, the young professional earning a, a decent decent salary but can't just go and chuck you know, a few hundred mm. thousand dollars down on a deposit, are you a fan of the, I don't know whether it's called rent vesting, where you'll buy somewhere that you can't afford but you maybe don't want to live and then rent in the areas. Is that a strategy that you see people using often? 100%. It's a bit of a buzzword, the rent vest strategy. Mate, I see a lot of youngsters do it and do it really well. So in a nutshell, what it is is you're obviously tied to a location for emotional reasons. It could be work. It could be you like the lifestyle. So instead of, even if it's an expensive area, instead of trying to buy in there and save up your whole life savings to get in there, what you could possibly do is rent there, invest into areas that are primed for growth. Once they're primed for growth, you're extracting equity and keeping going. And because those percent rate of your capital growth rate, like it's like your basically your net wealth is in, increasing. You're still living in the same area. You'll get to your dream property a lot sooner because all of a sudden that one asset has resulted in two, three, or four assets because of the growth. And then if you've got, you know, anywhere from three to six good little assets everywhere, you know, it's kind of like, well, you pull or you can sell down and then you're basically back in your dream dream suburb, paying outright potentially. So what would your advice be or what's the strategy? It might be that you might have something else up your sleeve for people that want to get into property, particularly in Sydney, it's so difficult, like you said, on a limited budget, or on a limited salary, not you know, base salary, but it can be, it's so competitive living in these main cities to get in the, in the door. What's kind of a, a good strategy for people looking that just, they want to get in their first property. I'll tell you one book I read that really shifted my mindset was it's called Cashflow Quadrant. 
from Robert Kiyosaki. I haven't read it, but I've heard a couple people say it's actually really good. Really good. And he's a dude who wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad about cash flow quadrant, talks around the four quadrants and you really want to get on the right side of the quadrant. So there's a difference between being able to make money and then being able to invest money. And I heard this one the other day and I really, really liked it. So stage one is you need to be able to know how to make money. At the end of the day, you, you can't, if you've got no money, you can't invest. End of story. So step one is how's your habits? How's your discipline? How's your spending habits? Are you spending all your things on Uber Eats and um, gambling and those sorts of things? At the end of the day, you don't have the characteristics to make an investor. So stop dreaming about being an investor. So that's number one. Like can you actually make money? And second to that is if it's not your job, like salary, are you better off maybe starting a business or something where your income, you're in charge of your income. So that book really highlighted to me that to be on the right side where everyone wants to be, like the investor, you, you first have to tick a few boxes from a discipline point of view. You just, you need to be able to make money first. That's, that's probably number one. And if it's a case of you're on a limited salary, you know, you don't want to sacrifice a, a poor salary and in going into some really poor asset. Maybe it's a case of, hey, could I monetize? Could I have a side hustle? Could I monetize my passion into a business? Um, and then your make money column goes up and then you're like, okay, now I'm primed for solid investing. That'd be, that'd be step number one, I reckon. I love that. So many people want to skip ahead. Oh, So many people want to skip ahead and it's the same with starting a business as well, but like... They lack, have no self-confidence, no discipline, yes. none of that. It's like, and I just want to give me your best e-com, like, because I do a lot of mentoring and yes. stuff with people in e-com. Give me your best, like, how can I make 100K as soon as possible? It's like, well, look, I'll, I'll tell you that, but honestly, I can tell you, if you don't fix these three things about the way you think and see the world behave, you're not going to do it anyway. Yes. People always want to jump ahead and it goes back probably to that, like, instant gratification kind of Definitely. generation that's coming up and, like, I'm kind of a part of as well, but luckily, like, I didn't grow up with a lot of money as well. Like my my um, parents were immigrants as well from Ireland. They didn't they didn't have a lot. So mm, and and you you're exactly right. It's like the discipline factor is probably number one. You know you you need to be able to make money. So when when you tick that box, if you're making money, because here's one I heard on a podcast the other day, which just shut the lights off for me. I loved it. It was like there's a difference between making money and then being wealthy. So you're at the first stage. You could have a pump in business. But if your income to spending ratio is one to one, you can't invest. So there, there's another one. People from the Instagram world, they look at it, oh man, it must be killing it, making so much money, <laughs> but the asset column's yeah. empty, you know? So that's another cool little, little thing I'm, I'm noticing as well. It's like, it's, it's good you want to invest, but okay, now you're, you can make money. You have got a pump in business or you're pumping salary. Can you now turn that into putting things in the asset column and it's rich dad poor dad. It's like it, check yeah. the asset column out. That's people in my world, e-com, all the, all the kids doing drop shipping or whatever, starting brands, they're making a few hundred thousand a year, but yeah, they're spending a couple hundred thousand a year exactly. as well, or almost all their money. Right. It's like it, you might look really cool on Instagram, but okay, if all that turned off right now, where would you be? You'd, you'd have nothing left. Yeah, mate, exactly right. And that's why this podcast I listened to, um, I'll give it to you off air, man. Yeah. It, it was a game changer, but it, it just basically highlighted – it was like the new age thing he's noticing mm -hmm. and it's like there's a difference. First, you need to be able to make money. Yep. Once you can make money, whether that's a business or whatever, um, then can you build an asset column? Mm. That's a different game, different game. Yep. Just because your, your, your income statement's good doesn't mean your, your asset column's good. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you one more question then we'll wrap up now. I know, look, I've looked at a lot of your content, so I know which way you might take this, but just for a lot of people out there, and we kind of did touch on this a little bit, but I just want to know four market conditions like these, high inflation, high interest rates, a little bit of uncertainty about what will happen over the next six to 12 months. For someone that has been saving up and planning or, or, or still is really ready to invest, what, what kind of strategies, what sort of mindset should they approach these current conditions with if they were looking to enter the market again this year? Awesome question, I think. Firstly is understand the difference between being able to make money and turn that money into being wealthy. I think that's number one. So what I mean by that is, yeah, get good at being a, a saver, be disciplined with your money. And yeah, as I said, don't just judge someone on making money. Judge it yourself on 
how much of the money are you actually taking home as net? That's number one. And then when you've got some net, then it's around, okay, don't listen too much on the noise because the media is, they're always here to sell clicks and sell papers and, and get you to watch, you know, fear. So my investor mentors always told me just stay in your own lane and, and do your own due diligence. As I said, if there's, you need to be able to understand value on a property and if you identify that that makes sense, don't be afraid um, to, take, to take action. So it's around if you've got the funds disposable, the next six to 18 months I think are the most opportunist markets I think we're going to see in a in a while. So um, there's a reason why, again, people you historically the, made the best returns was, you know, during the recession, during um, 2011, the, they had the crazy, um, there was floods and different things and it was crazy up in Queensland. Um, COVID, the people who are game enough to take a punt in COVID, <laughs> they, they've all doubled their money, tripled. So we're in one of those winter seasons right now from an economic point of view. So do your due diligence and if you have done your buffers and you've got things in place, the key thing is you need to be able to take action because at the end of the day, the, the, the people who actually have a crack and this is in business, this is in sport, this is in everything, the ones who can actually take the leap and have a crack uh, are generally the ones who, who do well. Something I just want to ask one last thing because you mentioned a couple of times setting your buffers. How do you kind of work them out? For, for someone that you're going to be you're going to be working with i reckon a good one is firstly again I'm, I'm really big on spending habits and just disposable income because again you never want to invest if you're up to your eyeballs and debt and stress because that's not fun for anyone so that's always number one is just how's it stuff at home like um even with my my business and my home like, like i like to have a, a breathing um cash like you got to have that rainy day cash, just always ready because anything can happen. And that's what I noticed the best investors I've worked with, they don't go up to their eyeballs. And it was a quote I sort of heard is like solid investors aren't afraid to take um, uh, calculated risk, but they never put it all on the table mm. and never put it all on the table. Is, is there like a ratio of cash to, to debt that you like to work off or cash like – I know I've got X amount of properties. If that, if the rent stopped coming in, I should have X amount of weeks or months in, in, in the bank. Is there safety precautions or measures that people can use around those sorts of figures? I think for the first, and when you're starting the portfolio, you know, being able to get a 20%. So think of the house purchase you're trying to get. If you can get to a comfortable 20% deposit on that, I think going up to 95% and leaving yourself a small buffer is kind of risky, in, in, especially in this market. Because um, all it takes is one one interest rate up or down, you know, and you, you're gone. I think 20% is very safe and, and very manageable. Um, in terms of cash cash assets stored away, I mean, it really depends on how big of an investor you want to be as well, right? Like um, it's a different answer for different levels of, of investing. I, I think this is a very personal thing, right? I, I've worked with some who do really well and they only invest in sub 500K, um, and they're, they're always keeping a check. But then, you know, I've worked with some investors, they're working with three to $5 million assets, but they're doing really well and they're super safe as well. Mm. And they've got a certain amount of cash assets. It, it's again, they've, they've both got the same mindsets. They're just playing in different yeah. different fields. And uh, again, I, one, one th- key tip for finishing is that the thing I noticed though with both of them is they take calculated risks. They've, they aren't afraid to jump when we say jump but they've done all the hard work in the in the back end. They've done the due diligence. As I said, they have got cash, but there's not they're not putting everything on the line for this one one deal. I think that's the 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 important point as well. Like you take calculated risk, but you want to make sure you're not putting it all on the table. Your wife and kids, the roof over their head. Like it's yeah. Yeah, I think I think it was our, our boy Hermosi. I heard him. I, I'll get it wrong, but yeah, it was something like um, the best investors he's noticed. You know they're. They're not afraid to put a uh, bit of money down, but they'll never put it all down in one one hit. All right, Matt, uh, thanks so much for dropping your knowledge, for coming in. I really, really enjoyed talking to you. Where's the best place for people to find more info on you or the Sharma Group? Um, obviously, you, you work up in the Gold Coast. There'd be plenty of listeners from up around that way, but what's the best place people can check you out? Yeah, just Matt underscore Sharma, www.thesharmagroup.com and 
reach out and uh, I know it's a growing industry as well so I'm really passionate about helping uh, any young BAs trying to trying to make it in the game because I know it's it's definitely turning a lot of heads in Australia right now so yeah reach out I'm always happy to add some value to the community Awesome, man. And I know someone who bought a first property in the last few years, dude, there's so fucking much work and research involved. And <laughs> if you're really busy, I'm telling you, there was a lot easier way to go about it than the way I did. I wish I knew about buyer's agents, but that just goes to show like how much we're still all learning, you know yeah, what I mean? So that's why I love these conversations. That's why I loved hearing, hearing your thoughts and all that. But thanks again. Uh, safe flight home later this evening and uh, we'll, speak, we'll speak soon, Major man. man. Appreciate it. Cheers, bro. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode or you got something out of it, do yourself a favor, do me a favor, do your friends a favor and share this with them and they can come along on this journey with us. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.